I'm going to talk about counseling. Good. Now, um, let me say this: the difference between counseling and teaching, or telling people what to do. Now, I have to say this. I'm sorry. I hope you don't mind. Many pastors are used to teaching and telling people what to do, and then when you, when there are people who are obedient, it works. There are people who are obedient who want to learn how to serve God, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, then it works. The pastor tells him, and then he does it. Very good. But for people who have problems following God, who have a lot of sins, a lot of burdens, or they have to overcome certain hindrances, or they are reluctant, or they think they are not capable, for anyone like this, we need counseling. What's the difference between counseling and teaching? Teaching basically is telling them what to do. So when people are ready, then we can just tell people what to do. But counseling is letting the person know where he is. For instance, he is here. You want him to go here. If you just tell him, for instance, a couple who are fighting, who is fighting, and you tell them, go home and forgive each other and love each other and, and pray together and love God together and serve God together. Are they going to do it that night? No. Oh. no. Because they have a lot of hindrance. They have so many negative thinking and feelings inside them that blocks their life. So it's very hard for them to change right away. So how can we help them to change? Now counseling is not just in a regular counseling session. It can be for you to help your children or to help the people who serve God or even when you do evangelism. Everything we do, or even when you talk with your husband and wife, you try to help your husband and wife to change his or her, her mind in a certain way. If you just tell him or her, do this, do that, he might not do it. So we want to guide the person to change for the better. So how do we do that? The first is we listen with empathy. It's very important. Because when people, they are behaving a certain way, they have the reasons, and they have their feelings. Let me ask you, when you feel about yourself, when you feel about yourself, when you have feelings toward yourself, do you find that that your feeling, for instance, some people's feeling is, I don't like myself, I like myself, I'm happy with myself, I'm not happy with myself, I feel guilty. Do you find it easy to change the feelings? No. The feelings are hard to change. The reason is, that is in our subconscious mind. Because since childhood, people might beat you and yell at you, and all these years, we might feel very bad about ourselves. So the first thing we do is not to change them, and to let them know, I know where you are. I know how you feel. I accept how you feel. And that is why Jesus said to the woman, take heart, don't worry. That Jesus was feeling the feeling of the woman. Jesus did not just tell her to change. Jesus let her know that he treasured her. She's, she is his daughter. So the first thing we do, for instance, to build up the marriage relationship, is not just for us to say, uh, husband, do this, do that. It doesn't work. The first step, most important, for us to build up the relationship with the husband and wife is to say, I know you have feel you have felt difficult in this relationship. You felt you have so much burdens. It was difficult for you for this all these years. I'm sorry about that. Will that soften her heart? Yes. Yes, you will. Because we understand the person. When people feel understood, they feel loved. And then they change, right? But when people feel they are commanded, Someone command you, change, forgive. Will you change right away? No, because we have a sinful nature. We have the feelings inside. So, now, but for many people, it's very hard to accept this. 
for many people, is very hard to accept. Let me tell you my experience with one pastor in Africa. I told him about counseling. He told me, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I, I believe in teaching people, telling people what to do. I say there is a place for that, but there is a place for counseling. But he did not accept it. And I explained to him why we need to counsel, because we need to accept the person's feeling and, and let the person know where he is and then guide the person step by step. And then the next day he said to me, I agree with you now, counseling is important. I said, what happened? He said, last night my mother called me. And my mother said to me, do this, do that, be a good pastor, be a good husband, be a good father, all do all this. And I told my mother, I know all this. And my mother kept talking and kept talking. And I felt she didn't hear me. And she felt, he felt bad. <laughs> so he realized when someone just told him what to do, he didn't feel good, and he didn't have the motivation to change. Have you noticed? If people just tell you to change, we don't have the motivation to change. But when someone loves us first, that's why it's important to have love. That's why Jesus came. He came to show us God loves us all. And when Jesus came, he loves the people. He cared about the people. He had compassion on the people. And that's why the people would listen to him. And he called the disciples. Why did they listen? Obey. Because they sense, now there could be different reasons. Maybe they heard his preaching. And then they were moved by the preaching. And maybe his word and his expression shows love. And maybe all together also the power of the Holy Spirit moved in the heart. Let me ask you about the move of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit moves you to serve God, does he do this? You have no good. You have to obey. You have to serve God. You have to listen. Repent. Repent. Does the Holy Spirit do this? No. No. The Holy Spirit touch you, comforts you, oh, and then you feel very comforted, right? And then you're willing to change. Is that true? Yes. We can see this. You know, the Bible says we love because God loved us first. It's love that can change people. Why do other religions, other religions, why can't other religions change people internally? Because it's just the law. The law doesn't change people. And many parents always tell the kids, read the books, study, obey me, do all these things. And the, the, the more they say it, the more the children rebel, right? Yes. But if the parents say to their child, I'm so happy you did this. I'm happy you, you were studying, even no, no matter how little she, he studied. You have studied, I like that. You're doing very well. And the child suddenly will work very hard. So acceptance is very important. Do you agree with that? Yes. Do you need acceptance? Yes. Do you like your husband and wife to accept you? Yes. Is the acceptance of your pastor important to you? Yes, if your pastor just say, you're not doing well, you're not doing well, you have to obey. Or if your pastor say, I notice that you listen to the word of God. I notice that you start to obey him. You start to serve God. How does it make you feel good? How does it make you feel? You feel good, right? Because the pastor appreciate you and accept you. So that's why all this teaching these few days, I've been encouraging you to say words of grace. Oh, by the way, the three kinds of prayer, the first kind is the prayer of grace, G-R-A-C-E. Because everyone who did the homework put it prayer of praise or prayer of uh, something else, but it's the prayer of grace and the prayer of worship and interactive prayer. The first one is grace, G-R-A-C-E, the blessings of God. That's why I said in these few days, say words of grace. I like you, I thank you, you are doing very well, I appreciate you, I like what you do. That encourage people, right? But we still need to say words of the law, but we guide them. How can we do better? And uh, how, uh, how can we handle this problem? So these are ways to say the words of the law in a gentle way. Now I come to counseling. You have one person who is very hard 
or who has all kinds of burdens, or who wants to serve God, but he doesn't know how to do it. The first thing, if someone comes to you and says, I want to learn to serve God, what can we say first? We can say first, you want to serve God? That's wonderful! You have the heart to serve God? That's wonderful! You have this heart. It came from God to move in your heart. What is that? Appreciation. And the person will realize why I want to serve God. Because God has been moving in my heart. And that's why I want to serve God. And then the person realizes God is working in his life and he feels good about himself, right? Now it's important that we feel good about God and about ourselves. Let me tell you, the language inside you is feeling. Let me explain this to you. The language inside you is not verbal, it's feeling. Let me use an illustration. When you remember your childhood, when you grew up, is your memory happy, unhappy, excited, full of adventures, full of love and care, or full of uh, demands and accusation? Now you may forget what people said to you, but we might remember happy and unhappy feelings, right? And then it stays in the heart that we might feel happy about ourselves or feel unhappy about ourselves. So inside us there is a language. That person is happy or not happy. Is excited about himself. He, he likes himself. Uh, he finds hope. He has hope. We have these feelings inside us. That is affecting our life. Now why do many people, why do many people find it hard to change their life? Because inside them, they have a language of despair and pain and suffering and pressure and burdens. Is it true? Yes. Then it's very hard for them to serve God. Even when they serve God, they serve God with a lot of pressure. So the first thing Jesus came is to heal the broken hearted, to comfort all who mourn. All you who are weary and burdened come to Jesus and then you can find rest. This is what Jesus first did. He comforts our heart, He forgives our sin, take away our guilt so that we can have strength to serve God. Is it true? Yes. If, a ser if a person is suffering, can he serve God well? No. no. So then we understand we need to comfort ourselves. We can comfort ourselves every day. When you learn to comfort yourself, then you, then you can comfort other people. How can you comfort yourself? Every day, we declare the prayer of grace. God is loving me. Hallelujah! God is blessing me. God is with me. God is helping me. God has a wonderful plan in my life. And then if anything happens to us, we say it doesn't matter. People cannot hurt me. People cannot take away my blessings. I'm blessed by God. It doesn't matter. So we have to comfort ourselves continually so that inside us we have joy coming out. Is it easy to have joy coming out? Is it easy? Is it easy? Yes, I'm asking you realistically. Are you having joy every day? See, we have to be realistic. We want to be joyful, right? But how many Christians are really joyful? Not too many. Let me ask you, how many of you are really joyful from the depth of the heart every day? How many of you are happy and joyful and confident every day? Raise your hand. You notice not too many people raise their hand because we want to be joyful, but we might not be joyful. So we need healing. Do you agree? Amen. Our heart needs healing. So we need the love of God, the comfort of the Lord, and we need to counsel ourselves, to tell ourselves, what you have done for God, God is happy. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. What is demand of a steward is that he's faithful. So when you're faithful, God is what? When we are faithful, God is happy with you. 
So you can tell yourself, I have been faithful. Let me ask you, have you tried to be faithful in some way? If you have, then you can tell yourself, I've been faithful, now even though I can grow more, but God is happy with me, so I can be happy that I've been faithful. That way it will take away the guilt, right? But many people serve God. Instead of feeling faithful, they will say, no, I haven't done well enough. I've failed many things. I should do more. I haven't done enough. Do you find that in your heart? Because we always count what we did not do and did not count what we have done. If we have count what we have done, we'll say, I'm doing well. Of course, we need to grow more. But we ask God to forgive us for the shortcomings and then we grow more. It's very important. Each day we look at a positive. I have grown so much. Thank God for the growth. And I can grow more. Instead of saying, there are so many things I haven't done yet. When we look at the things we have not done, how does it make us feel? Insufficient and guilty, right? So we need to first counsel and comfort ourselves before we comfort anyone. Do you agree? Yes. And it takes work. Every day when you pray, when you have any unhappy feeling coming up, counsel yourself. We have all reasons to be happy because God is blessing me. God wants to bless me and God treasures me. God is a wonderful plan in my life. So that until we totally believe in that. But let me tell you, no one on earth here is like the Christians in heaven. All the Christians in heaven, they're full of joy. Hallelujah! <laughs> All the Christians in heaven, no more burdens. But in this world, we still have the sinful nature. We still have the accusation. But the more we can remove this accusation, the negative feeling, the more we are like the Christians in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. It means you have the life quality, the joy, and the peace, and the freedom of the Christian in heaven. And then you will have love. When you have freedom, you'll have love. When a person is burdened, is it easy to love? No. It's hard to love. He, can, he doesn't even know how to love people. So in counseling, very important, first we comfort ourselves. Then we comfort people. When people come to us, they say, well, I've been fighting with my husband or wife, or he has been fighting with me, I'm very unhappy. Now, for many people, they counsel, you mean they say, repent. Ask God to forgive you. How can you fight with your, pet, your, your spouse? It, you have sinned, repent. So the first thing the counselor did, instead of accepting the feeling, the counselor immediately accused and command. Does it work? No, because the person must have his or her reasons that she has the problem in marriage, right? No matter what it is, maybe it's his sin, maybe it's his problem, but still there are reasons. Let me ask you, is it true that we all have done wrong in our marriage? Is it true? But we are also limited by some limitation, right? We try to overcome but it's hard. So you like your, your spouse will understand you, and you like people to understand you. Then you feel accepted. Then you have the strength to change, right? So when people come to us and say, I have problem in marriage, we don't say repent. Now we can say later. It's right for him to repent. But the first thing we say, I know it is difficult for you. Say it with me. I know it is difficult for you. I know you feel bad. You can say, I know you feel bad. Or you can say, please tell me about your feeling. How do you feel now? Say, please tell me how you feel now. Let the person just talk about it. Let them talk doesn't mean I agree with his thinking and feeling. It doesn't mean that. For instance, a child, a child is crying. Do you agree that he should cry? No. But you can hold him and say, oh, I know that you feel unhappy. Can we say that to a child? I know you're unhappy. We're not agreeing that he should be unhappy, right? But we can accept. It's different. I accept it, but it doesn't mean I agree with him. Can you understand this too? I accept that he's unhappy, but I 
you know, I know that I want to help him to change so that he's not unhappy. So the first thing we want to do, listen to the person with patience. With counseling is very important. Now it depends on the person. Some people has more pain. Some people has more pain. Some people just come for help. Some people says, come to you, please help me spiritually. He's very peaceful. He just want help spiritually. Then you don't need that much empathy. But if someone come to you, you can see that he's suffering. Then you say, think if it were you there. You say, I know. You feel unhappy. You feel burdened. You feel pressure. I know it's difficult. And let me talk about it. And don't guess. Now sometimes we can guess, you know, the person is crying, you know he's unhappy. But sometimes people say, you must be feeling guilty. Now, the person might not be feeling guilty. That it might not be true. For something like that, we have to ask, how do you feel now? About your marriage, how do you feel now? So to accept and let the person talk, so his feeling can come out. So his feelings can be set free, so he can listen to you. So he can start to face his problem. Let me ask you, has there been anyone who listened to you? Who really listened to your feelings? In this world, how many people listen to your feelings? How many? Many people or not too many? Not too many. Do you like more people to listen to you? So when you counsel people, should we listen first? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So for counseling, we should listen. Of course, you find that person keep repeating. Then you can say, well, I agree with you. You're feeling very unhappy. You're feeling sad. You're feeling hurt. Uh, do you want it to change? Do you want something done? So we can ask after a while. Okay. Now, so how do we ask? We guide the person, we observe the person. At first we want to listen without any presupposition. Don't think that he's always wrong, but accept the person and listen. Let me tell you, this is very, very difficult. Many people went through counseling courses and they still cannot listen. I find it, I, I myself find it hard. And my wife has helped me a lot. She really listened very well. Sometimes, you know, when I see someone, I always take her along. And then, when a person talks, she can hear many things the person said, and I did not pay attention to. Because I have my own purpose. I have something I want to do. So I did not listen very well. And I did not listen very well the feeling. But my wife would tell me later. So she helped me a lot in listening. So I hope this is something we realize. Let me let us say it together. We have to learn to listen. It's hard to listen. Because we have our presuppositions. Now when we listen, what can we do? We can respond with acceptance. We can say, and you can say after me, I know it's difficult for you. I know it's difficult for you. The situation has made you unhappy. I can see that you are unhappy. I can see that you are under pressure. Can you tell me your feelings now? So the first thing is respond to the person's feeling and try to have empathy, even though the person is wrong. Even if the person has committed adultery, we want to change a person. If you just say, you have committed adultery, you kneel down and pray and ask for forgiveness, and then you, you confess your sins to the whole church, and then you change, the person might not be able to change. But if we accept, like Jesus, when the woman caught in adultery, did, woman, did Jesus first say, are you guilty? No. He said, where are the people who have accused you? They're all gone. And then Jesus said, Neither will I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So Jesus accepted her first. Accepted her and then told her not to sin anymore. So, okay, first we accept and then we verbally tell the person, but don't guess.
don't guess because very often the person might have feeling that we don't understand. For instance, I have talked a lot about myself, but you really don't know my story. You cannot guess my life. You don't know what kind of life I've gone through. If you guess, it might be wrong. And if I guess what kind of life you have, I might be wrong. So it's better to ask. Okay? So the first step is to have empathy and respond to the feeling. Say it together. First is empathy and respond to the feelings and support the feelings. Support the feelings. Support the feelings means, doesn't mean I support this action. I just support that he has hurt feelings. He has unpleasant feelings. Okay? Now let me name the feelings for you. There are a few main feelings, so you know what feelings are. Because many people cannot name the feeling. Okay? Glad. You can write down. Glad. G L A D. Glad. First feeling. Write down. Glad. G L A D. The feelings. The group of feelings. This is very important for you to remember if you want to counsel people. First, glad. Next, sad. S A D. Sad. S A D. Sad. Glad. Sad. The third, mad. That means anger. Angry. Glad, sad, mad, afraid, afraid. And number five, ashamed. And number six, hurts. Now these are the most common feelings. Very often, we ask people, how do you feel? They will say, I think the situation is good. I say, that's not a feeling. Especially men, it's very hard to name the feeling. It's very hard for men to say, I'm happy. Have you noticed your husband hardly will say, I'm happy. I'm very happy to see you. Did they say that to you? I'm very happy. It's hard for men to express feelings. We have to learn them. Now, why is it important to know our feelings? When we know our feelings, and then we can understand our feelings and we can handle the feelings and then we can work on the feelings. Let me tell you one of my experience when I was learning counseling. Uh, actually, it was uh, chaplaincy. I have learned to be a chaplain in a hospital and this has helped me greatly in counseling. In one group, small group session, one of our students was using foul language. And after the session, the teacher has the, the teacher has a, a monthly meeting with us every month. I forgot is it monthly or, or twice a month. And then he asked me, "How did you feel when the person used foul language?" Now my first my first reaction is, "He's wrong. He should not do that. That is not." feeling is thinking. It's thinking. Thinking is whether this is right or wrong, whether he should do it or not. But because I've been trained in that, so I searched myself, what feeling did I have? And I noticed I did have some anger. So I told the teacher, I guess I had some anger. And the reaction of the pastor was surprising to me. He stood up from his seat. And he reached out to me and stretched his hand to me and shook my hand and said, Congratulations! Why did he congratulate me? He said, Many pastors cannot say I'm angry. Many pastors would have anger inside and did not realize they have anger. Especially in Chinese, it's very hard to say I'm, I was angry. Now, I'm not saying it's right to be angry. But at least I realized I was angry, and then I can work on it. It's very important for us to name our feelings at any time. Now those feelings I just gave you are just group of feelings, like glad, including excited, including uh, you know, uh, feel hopeful, and all these positive feelings. Sad includes depression, unhappy, mad, anger, frustrated, and then afraid, uh, fear, and then ashamed also can include guilt and ashamed and 
and also have a low self-image. So we need to know these feelings, and then we can identify at that time, does the person have this feeling? For instance, the person said, I should have done more with my parents before they died. What feeling is he conveying? Guilt. So we can ask him, do you feel guilty about it? Now, instead of saying, you feel guilty, ask, do you feel guilty about it? And then he said, yes. And then we can say, yes, I did feel guilty too. Sometimes we have not done enough with someone and we feel bad for sometimes for a long time. Have you felt bad for a long time when we did not do something right? Many people are attacked by these negative feelings. So when we understand the feelings, we can accept the person and comfort the person, okay? So first, we listen, and then we uh, respond to the feelings, we empathize, empathize, and then what we do, we try to guide the person to know his situation. Or to guide the person to say he has a need. Or guide the person to say he needs to change. Now it, it depends, you know, for instance we can say, do you want to work on your guilt feeling? So instead of saying you have to work on it, it's better to ask. We should all learn this. To deal with people, it's better to ask. With your spouse, it's very important to ask. Instead of saying, you feel guilty, how does your husband or wife feel? If you say, you feel guilty, how does he feel? He feels you are accusing him, right? Yeah. So instead of saying, you, are, you feel guilty, we can say, how do you feel about yourself? When you haven't done enough, do you feel guilty? And then, and say, yeah, I agree with you, it's very difficult. And do you want this to change? So ask a person whether he understands the situation, whether he wants to change. And a person wants to change. Okay, now, you, you write down the steps, very important. To let them know what situation he is in, guide them to understand the situation, and guide them to want to change. Guide them. Instead of saying you have to change, you have to repent. You can ask, for instance, you want someone to repent. You can say, do you think there is a need to repent? Is this better? Do you think there is a need to repent? Is this better? But people don't like to say that. They like to say, repent. If, God, if not God, will punish you. People like to be teachers. Let me ask you, when people just shout at you and say, repent, repent, does it always bring you repentance? Or if someone say, do you think you need to repent in front of God? To be pleased by God? Do you want to be pleased by God? Do you want to truly, in the heart, think of the things we have done wrong and repent to God? Now, if someone talks to you like that, does it give you more motivation to repent? The reason is, because I accept you as a person. I respect you as a person. Do you notice the difference? Because I respect you as a person, I will ask you questions. I will let you choose. That way is a respect of people. Let me tell you the difference between God and Satan. God moves in the heart of people. God doesn't just force you. The Holy Spirit moves in the heart and people can reject the Holy Spirit. But Satan, when he, the evil spirit come into people, the person was out of control. So the whole, the evil spirit control people. But the Holy Spirit moves people. Let me ask you, if God is controlling, God in your heart, always control. And then when you go to heaven, turn right, turn left, stand up, sit down. It's always God says, and then you all have to obey immediately. That if it is like this in heaven, how do you feel? It's not freedom, right? Freedom is when we can freely worship God and then say, God, you're so wonderful. I love you. I adore you. I worship you. In heaven, are people doing it? Worship. I worship. I worship because God is 
making me worship you. God is making me worship, so I worship. Is it like this in heaven? No. In heaven, we are full of joy and we, wow, the joy just flow out. And the worship spirit just flow out from the heart. Because God doesn't control people. When we look at Hitler, what does he do? What did he do? He controls people, right? He controls people. When you look at many uh, extreme leaders, leaders that really, you know, they, the people really don't like, are the leaders who control the people, right? But if a leader listens listen to the people, the people are more responsive. But have you noticed that? The more people are into sin, the more they want to control. And in marriages too, many spouses like to control the other person. When you control the other person, does the other person want to follow? No. no. But he might follow because he's forced to. But it's best that person do it willingly. That is a loving relationship, right? So we understand this. So we don't force a person. Because we force it, it's just for now. But if we guide the person, and the person totally believes that, then he is guided to change. Counseling basically is guide to change. Say it together. Counseling is basically to guide people to change. Say it. Counseling is basically to guide people to change. To lead them, to let them think, to, to sort of ask questions. Do you want to change? Do you want the situation change? Do you want to have more strength in the Lord? Do you want to enjoy the relationship with God? Do you want to serve God more? And then the next thing we can ask is, have you tried to do it? Have you tried to do it? And what ways have you tried? Now all these questions are very important. What ways have you tried? He said, well, I have tried to talk to him and it doesn't work. Then we can ask, how did you talk to him? And how did he respond? So instead of telling him what to do, find out how he's relating to the spouse. So we ask, so how is the relationship? He said, very difficult. Do you want to change? Do you want to improve? He said, yes. So as, uh, I'd like to ask you, have you tried to work on it? He said, yes. And does it work? Not really. So what have you done? And then he told me that the people usually tell, say the fault of the other person. She always got angry with me. She always yells at me. Okay, and then I will ask the person, how did you talk with her? Did you listen to her? Did you care about her? And sometimes I would tell them first, tell him or her first about the male and female difference. And then have you been listening to your husband or wife? And how did you respond? And then he said, oh, maybe I did something wrong. I was too pushy. I was too harsh on him or her. And then I say, how can you change? And what are some ways you think you can change? And then he might name some ways. And then, and then I ask him, does it work? And what needs to be changed from the bottom? You know, what needs to be changed from the bottom is the heart. Then we can respect the other person. For many marriages, it's difficult because we don't respect the other person. We think the other person has no hope. And even for ministry, I hope you don't mind me saying that. Sometimes, because the leaders and the pastors don't understand the people, and don't speak to the heart of people, and just tell people to change, then people don't have the motivation to change. So we understand where people are, and then we can guide them. Do you want to change? Let me ask you. Do you all just, do you, all of you, how many of you want to stand in front of God and God will say you are a good and faithful servant? How many? Wonderful. Is there anyone who doesn't want God to say that? Anyone here who wants God to say you are wicked and lazy servant? Anyone here? Okay. So let me ask you. Are you willing to do something about that? Yes. Is it easy to change right away? Yes. It's not easy. But do you want to change gradually? Yes. If you change gradually, how does God feel? God feels happy. Will He give you strength? Yes. yes. Will He appreciate you? Yes. yes. So do you think you can keep changing for the good, for the better? See, just now I'm counseling you. 
I was counseling you. I was asking you, are you willing? Do you want? And then, do you really sincerely want? Do you sincerely want to stand in front of God? And God is very happy. I'm happy to see you come. You are good and faithful servant. I have one, you know, I appreciate you so much. You have helped so many people. Do you like Jesus to be excited when he sees you? Yes. Do you sincerely want that? Yes. And do you know what to do in order that Jesus is excited about you? Do you know what to do? Yes. Now, I have talked about that these few days. To love God, honor God, respect God, obey God, and serve God. All this thing is in the Bible, right? Yes. So is it too difficult to do? No. no, but it's hard to change. So you gradually do it, trying to do as much as possible. Then God is very happy with you. Now, I was counseling. This kind of message is different from you just have to stand in front of God. You will be judged. You have to repent and prepare your heart. You have to serve God. Did you serve God? You didn't serve God, you have to repent and start serving today. If you don't serve God, God will punish you. Now this is another way to change people. What is the difference between the first way and the second way? The first way has the respect for the people, right? I respect you as human being. Then you are wise human beings. You are Christians. You are born again Christians. You are not like a pig have no wisdom. Is it true? Yes. You have wisdom. So you are honorable people. Say to the person next to you, you are an honorable person. Honorable. When we respect people and then guide them to change, they won't willing to change, right? So this is the spirit of counseling. We let them know how they are. We can ask them, what do you think your condition is now? So what's the condition with your husband and wife? What is your spiritual condition? And what will that do to your life? And do you want to change? And how can you change? Have you tried? Does it work? And how can you do better? And can I suggest some ways you can change? Now basically, I'm summarizing counseling in a very short session. Now you understand counseling is basically having empathy with the people and guide them to understand the situation and guide them to change. That is counseling. But we need to have the respect for the wisdom of the person. That will res respect the person can think and they can decide and they can change. Of course, some people change faster, some people change slower. Sometimes after one counseling session, they don't change right away. Don't give up, don't give up. It's hard for people to change. But at least they tried. Did you try anything? Yes, a little bit. I did try a little bit. Wow, congratulations, you have changed a little bit. We can congratulate people. Did you change anything? He said yes. Then we say, good, you are changing for the better. Can you change more? Can you change more? How can you change more? Have you noticed how I ask different questions? And the questions do not have a spine to pierce people. Now people, sometimes they ask questions that has a spine a spike to hit people. Now this is how people ask. Do you love God enough? Have you repented to God? Did you really obey God? Do you think God is happy with you? Now all these questions has an underlying statement underneath. You are not really repentant. God is not really happy with you. Do you think God is happy with someone like you? It's, it's, the question has a hidden message of dislike. So we don't want to carry that in counseling. Now I'm just giving you a very short uh, summary of what counseling is. And yesterday, the couple's standing out here. So first I let them, you know, I asked them, uh, do you want to work on a marriage? And then, uh, what, can you say something good about your person? And I asked them to say something specific, what's happening in a marriage? At first they were not able to do that, but gradually they can say it. But then I will guide them to name it specifically and name the problem and how, so next time how can you communicate with each other? So the next time when, because the man was afraid to tell the wife his decision because he disagreed with the wife. But I asked him, why did you dis why were you afraid? Because he said he was afraid to see the wife being angry because the wife, wife had an angry tone. So I guide them to find out what's the fact behind it. Now this is a skill of counseling.
to find out what is behind the problem. Why was there a problem? So I asked questions without making him feel bad. I did not accuse him. I just find out. And then when I heard that, I did not accuse the woman. I just let her know this is a situation. So how can she work on the feelings next time and the tone of voice next time? Have you seen that in action yesterday? Yes. I guided them without accusing them. So both of them feel good. Actually, in many counseling sessions of couples, many men said to me, you are the first man, man to understand me. There was no other man who can express this understanding of me, understand my difficulty. Everyone says, my wife is right and I'm wrong. That I, nobody understood him. So I was able to understand both the man and woman, and I understand both of them suffer. Both of them suffer. But God wants to work in their life, and I respect both of them. In counseling, most of the time, both persons suffer, and both need help, and both need to change. So I guide them and respect them. Okay? Any question? Because we cannot, you know, we cannot go on for too long. It's basically I'm giving you a brief summary and the spirit of counseling. Do you think it's important? Yes. Yes.